Hello, and welcome to our third and final day of alumni reunion at Princeton Theological Seminary. We continue to be immensely grateful that you have given us these three days to learn alongside us. We are delighted to welcome three of our faculty members, J. Paul Hines, Heath Carter, and Lisa Bowens. First, I want to turn this over to my colleague in ministry, Hustis Gilhoof. Hustis, it's all yours. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Justus Geilhofer. I was a special student from 2012 to 2013. I am a Lutheran minister in Germany. I am the pastor of the Freiberg Cathedral and I am also head of campus ministry at um, the University at Freiberg. I am so delighted and honored to be moderating this short session uh, that is basically listening to three outstanding scholars that we recently welcomed at Princeton Seminary. Dr. Heinz, Dr. Bowens and <clears throat> Dr. Carter. And first of all, I wanna thank you all three that you are willing to share your story. And without further ado, I wanna start with Dr. Heinz and welcome you um, in this session. Uh, J. Paul M. Heinz is the Assistant Professor of Pastoral Theology at Princeton Seminary. And I would love, and I am sure we all would love to hear your story. Please tell us your story. Thank you for the uh, introduction. And this is, I don't know, the third or fourth time we've had to tell our story. I think every time is a challenge of trying to figure out, is there something unique to bring out and share with the Princeton Seminary community? Um, my story has been very troubling to me for a lot of reasons. And one of the reasons that is, is because I don't believe that I truly have a story. There are stories, there are multiple events, of course, that have shaped who I am, multiple relationships that have brought me to this place, Princeton Seminary. Also, just as Probably, I guess I could put a philosophical matter. I always wrestle with the idea of story and privilege. Um, what is the privilege of saying I have a story? Because stories are so complex. Family has a role where you were born, where you were educated. And also the fact that all these things come together in such a way that sometimes the stories that we call our own, aren't particularly good, and aren't particularly healthy. A story may help to illuminate the point. When I was at Howard University, the Student Government Association there would from time to time go out and do community service. They'll go to a shelter, go to a food kitchen, different things to try to get engaged with the community. And probably my last year there, the SGA went out to a men's shelter in the Washington, D.C. area. So I went out to the shelter, not knowing what to expect. I think in my mind, I thought most of these persons there would be maybe teenagers, uh, who for whatever reason had fallen on hard times, didn't have a place to live. You know, kind of the typical story about a shelter. I was shocked to discover when I went there that there were adult males there, many of them in their early 20s to their mid 20s. I didn't know on this particular day that they were having a job interview 
session. They're going to have these mock interviews where you would interview one of the men there, find out what their particular skills were. But more important or more significant to the event than anything was this notion that you were, you were trying to learn their story. So myself and another person there interviewed about three of the young men there. And you could see how the dominant story was filtering into what they were trying to tell us. A lot of men said, you know, I'm a hard worker. I'm smart. I came from a good background, but things got awry at one point or another. Or something that they believe we want to hear about them. The dominant story. Now, what can I tell this interviewer that will make him hire me? But then we got to another young man who was there. He was sitting by himself pretty quiet the whole time. Here about 30 or 40 minutes into the whole session. So we sat there, began to talk with him, and asked him some pretty simple questions. Now, what are you good at? He sat there for about two minutes. I don't know. What kind of job do you want? I don't know. Now, what are your ambitions five years from now? I don't know. And then it dawned on me then, and I thought about it a lot afterwards, the power and privilege of saying you have a story. Without story, there's a loss of direction. Without story, you lose your meaning. Without story, there's a loss of purpose. And how do you negotiate that with the fact that even if you do know your story, some people don't think it's a good one? Now, how many of us wrestle with this notion day to day that I wish I had a better story? Or I'm entrapped in this story that many people don't think is that good? What does it mean when you do share your story and people are disappointed in what you tell them? In my field of pastoral theology, one of the greatest challenges that I encounter in the classroom is trying to get students to understand that our stories are not over. That we have the power to rework our stories we have the power to make new stories. And what goes with that? New possibilities. No matter how bad my story may be to someone else, in my negotiating, in my reworking the story, something new is always possible. But at the end of the day, I had to figure out what does that mean to me? One of the great harms we do, even in our work to care for others, is to try to force them into a pre-made story. What we believe would be good for them, based upon our notions of what a good story is. I want to close with this. My time is winding down. My story is tied to Princeton Seminary in a lot of ways. When I first walked on this campus in the summer of 2004, for summer Greek, exiting Brown Hall across the way there, I encountered a fellow student. He began to interrogate me about my story. He asked me a series of questions. Where are you from? was the first one. I'm from East Orange, New Jersey. That wasn't good to him. What church do you go to? I go to a small Pentecostal church, not really known. That wasn't good for him. 
What school do you go to? You know, Morehouse, Howard? No, I went to a small Catholic school called Felician College. <laughs> that wasn't good enough for him either. And then what happens for us in our own self-development? when people say our story isn't good. A question they had about Jesus when he first emerged out of Nazareth was what? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of East Orange, New Jersey? Can anything good come out of that small Pentecostal church that you were a part of before arriving at Princeton Seminary? Can anything good come out of a small Catholic school called Felician College? And in our ministries here, especially in my given field of pastoral theology, not only do we have to work on reworking our stories, but also challenging notions of what the good is. Because I don't believe the good necessarily means moral goodness, something without failing. Does the good necessarily mean some kind of physical appeal? Is the good always the beautiful? Not necessarily so. But I believe that the good also means something different. Can anything different come out of these spaces that are dominated by a bad story? That's the challenge I believe I have in my ministry here at the seminary. I believe that's the challenge we have when we encounter people who believe they don't have a good story. And I believe that's the challenge we have in our daily walk of faith. Are you just another Christian or a good Christian? Is there something different about you? Are you just another guy from East Orange or what's different about you? And I hope today at this reunion meeting, we take up the challenge to find out what is good about our stories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Heinz, to, um, for this touching reflection on what it actually means to have a story and to um, for sharing your personal view on that and for sharing your story. Whenever you feel like you have a question to Professor Heinz, Professor Bones or Professor Carter, you can always send a direct message to Sheena Roll. Sheena Roll is um, part of this session and you can always send her a direct message and she will collect all of your questions and will then forward them uh, to, um, yeah, to present them at the end. So feel free to ask whatever question you want to ask and send it to Sheena Roll. Now, again, thank you, Professor Heinz, for sharing your story. And I have the great privilege and joy to introduce us to our second speaker today, who, which is Lisa Marie Bowens. She is Associate Professor of New Testament at Princeton Seminary, and I am delighted to introduce her and eager to hear her story. Professor Bowens, thank you very much, and please share with us your story. So thank you, um, Ann Henley, for the invitation to share about my story with my colleagues, um, Dr. Carter and Dr. Hines. It's an honor and privilege for me to be with all of you today at this reunion at PTS. So here's a part of my story. I grew up as a pastor's kid. There were four of us all together. I have two sisters and one brother. Church was our life. Sunday school, revivals, vacation Bible school, choir rehearsals, traveling to convocations and other services. 
we lived next door to our church. So we were intimately involved in church life and also the life of our neighborhood. So my dad was not only the pastor of the church, he was also the pastor to the community. And we lived and our church was located in a lower income working class community. And so I have plenty of memories of times when we took people into our home who needed a place to stay, of giving meals to those who needed food. And um, when we prayed with a neighbor who had lost a loved one or rejoiced with someone who experienced physical healing or a new job. There are so many stories I could share, but I'm grateful for the examples my parents set for me as I watched them do ministry together. So even though my father was a pastor, my mom worked really closely with him in ministry. Both of them combined preaching, teaching, and living what they taught and preached. They embodied the gospel in their lives. I saw how they loved people. They devoted themselves to taking care of people spiritually, but also physically, making sure people had food and clothes, the necessities of life. Our church was small, but it was full of love. And the people who came there knew it was a place where they would be treated with dignity. Our church was also a Pentecostal church. So there was a great emphasis on the power of God to transform lives, to heal, and to make whole. There was also an emphasis to follow the Spirit's work in the world, and that the Spirit empowers us for service. There was also a focus on the sacredness of Scripture, and that God speaks to us through Scripture. Bible studies were rich spaces where we delved into the text, asked questions, and had lively discussions. And I remember we had great Bible discussion sessions in church, but we also as a family had great Bible discussions together as well. So I have great memories of these rich conversations about the meaning of the Bible. I saw the reality of God's power not only in the lives of my parents, but also in the lives of those who came to the church, who would often testify about how God helped them through the week. So part of the services for our church, we would have what we call a testimony, testimony part of the service, where different people would get up and testify about different things that had happened to them during the week. And I remember different congregants testifying about how God helped them or how God blessed them with food or healed their bodies of various illnesses. The church was a safe haven for me and for those who attended, but not a safe haven in the sense that it was a place to withdraw from the world in isolation, but it was a place that was a reservoir of strength and love in the midst of challenges. It was a place where you could get, quote, recharged to face the world and be empowered to make a difference. Although I come from a long line of pastors and preachers, not only is my dad a pastor, but both of my grandfathers were pastors and my grandmother was a minister. My mom is a minister. My brother's a preacher. I come from a long line of pastors and preachers. And even though that's a part of my story. Initially, I did not feel called to ministry. Although when I went to undergrad, went away to college, I got very involved in my church there during my undergrad um, years. I was very active in the church, attending college ministry groups, getting involved in the media ministry. Um, but my undergrad degree was in business education. And so that's where I put my focus I wanted to teach business courses, which I did for a while. And I ended up teaching middle and high school students. Eventually, however, I ended up becoming a media specialist teaching elementary um, school. And it was while um, I was doing that, 
that the seed for attending seminary was planted. Although I initially resisted the idea, eventually I realized that this was something God was calling me to do. And so I attended Duke Divinity School and it was a transformative experience for me. Seminary offered me new ways of understanding the scripture that I loved so much. I had great professors and TAs who journeyed with me in the process. And to this day, many of them are still dear colleagues. After leaving Duke, I applied here to PTS as a doctoral student. And once again, I found new ways to understand scripture. My doctoral program expanded my understandings of the second temple period and the world of Paul, with whom I have always been fascinated. How does knowing Paul's context, the world in which he lives and moves, shed light on scripture and foster a deeper understanding of God's word? Here in my doctoral program at PTS, I had the opportunity to read and translate the Book of Watchers, part of 1st Enoch, and to explore other ancient Jewish writings and their connections with the New Testament. So once again, I found myself in a community, a safe haven of ancient writers and believers who often testify of God's wonders in the world and God's awesome power. I became a full-time faculty member here at PTS in 2014 and I enjoy teaching New Testament courses. I take teaching seriously because I view it as a calling and an important part of my ministry. Therefore, I'm always seeking to grow in this area and to try new ideas and that make the teaching process more dynamic for me and my students. I teach a number of courses, but I would like to highlight two in particular. The first is Introduction to New Testament Exegesis, which consists of several modules, Greek translations, exegesis, and then we look at a variety of methods um, of scripture, such as feminist hermeneutics, African-American hermeneutics, Asian-American hermeneutics, and so on. Paul's letter to the Galatians is the focus text for that class. The other course I want to highlight is the one called African-American Pauline Hermeneutics, which in that course, we traced how African-Americans have interpreted Paul from the 1700s to the present. This course originated out of my research on African-American Pauline hermeneutics. And in this class, we read enslaved petitions, sermons, autobiographies, as well as um, other writings from African-Americans. And we talk and discuss about how African-Americans have utilized the Apostle Paul to resist injustice and advocate for liberation. I find teaching, writing, and researching to be rewarding and challenging, especially in the times in which we live. While these moments are challenging, they are also opportunities to show God's love at work in the world. And as I reflect on how to do that, I remember my childhood and seeing my parents' examples. We do it one person and one life at a time. Thank you. Dr. Bones, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, thank you for sharing um, a childhood um, I can relate to as a pastor's child. And I think we all can um, see what um, God has done um, within your um, call to teach and to minister this community. Thank you very much. Again, a short reminder, if you have questions, not, all, not only for Dr. Heinz, but also for Dr. Bowens, please send them directly to Sheena Roll and um, ask whatever you want and she will collect them at the end and she will moderate the Q&A session. Now, last but definitely not least, I want to introduce us all to um, Professor Heath W. Carter. Heath Carter is Associate Professor of American Christianity, and I am delighted um, to introduce him to all of us, and I think we all want to hear your story, Mr. Carter. It's wonderful to be with you all today. Uh, thank you so much to Anne Henley for including me and allowing me to present alongside my 
very distinguished colleagues, uh, Dr. Hines and Dr. Bowens, it's a pleasure um, to share a little bit about my story. Um, I am a historian of American Christianity. I'm really interested in the, the intersection of Christianity and public life in the history of the modern United States. So I, I think that's a pretty perennial interest for me, um, and I thought I'd kind of give you a little bit of a sense um, in the short time we have today of maybe how I, I became interested in that intersection. Um, my grandfather was a pastor, but in a very, very different world than the world of Princeton Seminary. Um, he attended Ozarks Bible College and uh, was very much immersed in a kind of conservative evangelical or fundamentalist kind of world in the Midwest. Um, and I kind of grew up around that world. I grew up in Kansas uh, first, the first 10 years of my life in kind of conservative, evangelical, non-denominational, Baptist-ish sorts of churches. Uh, my family was very committed to church. I grew up going to Sunday school. I knew the Bible uh, as well as one can as a young child. Um, and in some sense, I feel like for me and my family, we were, you know, my, me and my brother were sort of uh, raised to see ourselves as kind of growing up almost in, in a latter-day chapter of the biblical narrative. These stories that we read in the Bible, uh, we took to be kind of the, the gospel truth exactly as they were described, and um, we were part of that kind of unfolding narrative. Um, it was a corner of kind of the American Christian world uh, that had interesting beliefs about the end times. I grew up in the thick of a kind of dispensationalist evangelicalism that had very, very particular, specific ideas about the end of the world, and those were very present to me. Um, and all that was sort of in the background when we moved to Southern California when I was 10 years old, and we became part of, you know, if, if my, in my early years I was part of these kind of smaller, more traditional Midwestern evangelical churches, uh, we moved to Southern California and we started attending uh, what was then a much smaller church, but now, uh, even by, then by my standards, and now certainly quite large, uh, Saddleback Church, uh, part of this sort of seeker-sensitive movement of the early 1990s. I remember uh, growing up then in Southern California and as a teenager watching the Thief in the Night movies. Again, that was part of that sort of end of the world, uh, and, and I was terrified. And, and for me, again, it was very real. I was scared to death of being left behind, and I was growing up in this kind of suburban Orange County environment, but in a very particular way, um, in a very particular kind of Christian world. We lived across the street from my elementary school. I would wander out in the afternoon to make sure I could still hear kids playing, because that way I knew that the rapture hadn't happened. Um, that was the sort of intensity of, of the, the way that I grew up. Those were also the sort of 80s and 90s were the heyday of the moral majority, a movement that was firmly entrenched in Southern California for reasons that a lot of my colleagues in uh, my field have been studying for quite some time now. Uh, and my family was a part of that movement. It was hard for me to imagine growing up uh, that a Christian could be uh, anything other than the way that my family thought about politics and culture and whatnot. I, I never fell in love with Southern California. Again, I said the Kansas was strong in me. And uh, as I looked at colleges, I looked uh, at the possibility of going to the East Coast. I was fascinated, just sort of like really deeply interested in politics. So when my dad and I went on a college trip right before my senior year of high school, we stepped a foot onto Georgetown University's campus. I immediately fell in love. I was in love, partly it was in DC. It was a a gorgeous campus. To be honest, uh, Georgetown, if you don't know, is, it's a Catholic, it's a Jesuit university. I didn't know it was Catholic. Uh, I'm not sure that I knew what a Jesuit was, um, but I loved the location. I thought it was beautiful, and I was really interested in the kind of political connections in the world that Georgetown was a part of. Um, and sort of this evidence that God has a sense of humor, my freshman roommate was the son of a Democratic congressman and a lifelong Catholic. So sort of the, the polar opposite of everything that I had been sort of grown up to believe was, was true and right, uh, the way that Christians thought about the world. Uh, we spent the fall of 1999, our freshman year, arguing over all sorts of different political issues. Those were the years of the Clinton impeachment and all, countless other things. Um, I think one of those things that sort of came through in those conversations was, as I look back now on kind of the way I grew up, um, there was a lot that I think was interesting and strange and, and sort of uh, particular, peculiar even about it. Um, but I did grow up with, and I'm grateful today still, 
for, a, uh, for the sort of strong sense that I grew up with that the gospel had something to say um, to all of life. And, and that was certainly something that came through loud and clear in my upbringing. In college, I was drawn first to government and psychology classes. Like I said, that interest in politics. Um, but at Georgetown, we were required to take two theology classes. And so the second semester of my sophomore year, I took my second required theology class, just trying to sort of get it out of the way. And lo and behold, um, I fell in love with it. I just found it so interesting. I almost couldn't believe that I could get college credit for taking a class where we were uh, thinking and writing and, and, and talking together about God. So I dropped my government major and sort of uh, entered into a kind of theology boot camp for my last two years of college. So I was this evangelical uh, teenager in a kind of Catholic university setting. My advisor was a a biblical scholar named Father Jim Walsh. She was a, a Jesuit priest. He had a totally different way of reading the Bible than anything I had ever encountered growing up. We sat around in his Old Testament survey class, a bunch of 20 or so year olds, reading Jonah in Hebrew, one painstaking word at a time. I remember some class periods we would get through a sentence or two. Many, many students uh, really hated the class, but I loved it. Uh, for, for me, it was really revelatory. Um, I remember, you know, having lunch with Father Walsh one day. I was so struck by the new ways I was learning to read the Bible with him. And I just asked him, is this whole Christianity thing real to you? Or is it more of a cultural thing? That's the audacity of a 20-year-old who thinks they know what they're talking about. And, and Father Walsh said, it's real. And didn't say anything else. And I just didn't get it. Um, but I was sort of on a journey. And really what was happening there for me was a kind of encounter with a wider Christian tradition that I hadn't really encountered growing up. Um, a lot of my mentors at Georgetown had gone to the University of Chicago Divinity School. Um, I initially applied, probably through Father Walsh's influence, to study ancient Near Eastern mythology. But my senior year at Georgetown, I wrote a thesis on the Left Behind series. I was trying to figure out that world that I had grown up in. And that got me off and running uh, down a very different intellectual track. So I moved to Chicago, uh, started a master's program at the University of Chicago Divinity School, and in the meantime, got to know a city that really changed my life. Chicago is a big part of my own story. Um, again, I'd grown up in Kansas and in the suburbs of Southern California. I spent four years in Northwest Washington, D.C. But in Chicago, living in Hyde Park, I was confronted in a new way with the lines of inequality that shape that city so deeply. Um, just five minute bike ride away from the church that I attended in Hyde Park um, were neighborhoods that never came up in that church, that we never talked about, that we had no sort of sense of why these kinds of uh, deep lines of class and race existed or what the church, what Christianity might have to say about them. So I was sort of wrestling with that. I got married uh, during those early years in Chicago uh, to a woman, Thais. Uh, we are married today. We have three children, Isaiah, Samuel, and James, who have changed my life in ways that I couldn't begin to fit into this uh, time slot today, but I'd love to talk to you about sometime if I ever run into you on campus. Uh, intellectually, I was continuing to pursue sort of the lines that that Left Behind thesis had laid out for me, so I was... I. I Ended up studying American religious history at the Div School. Um, wrote a thesis on the rise of an evangelical left in response to the Vietnam War. And decided I wanted to go on and pursue my PhD. Um, there I, I, I went on to Notre Dame. Uh, studied with a fellow, Mark Knoll, who was sort of a historian of Christianity who had some similar interests to me. Although I think I also pushed him outside of his box. I became really interested in the question of kind of the labor movements relationship to Christianity in the, in the first Gilded Age and wrote my dissertation on that subject, uh, really was sort of sparked by this discovery that, uh, you know, I knew growing up in churches that you went into a church, you heard a sermon, um, and you didn't necessarily agree with it. You talked about it together after, after church or whatnot, and, and I ran into so many sermons early in my research of pastors preaching against unions, pre preaching against strikes, and I just wondered what did working people who heard those sermons have to say? And that was the, the kind of uh, question that led me into that first book. Right now I'm working on a new book here. I've been here at Princeton Seminary for two years. And the book I'm working on right now kind of comes out of that earlier research. It's, I'm trying to tell a new story about the social gospel in American life. It's an old story in my field, but it's been a long time since it's gotten a new narrative. So I've spent this year, I've been on sabbatical this year, 
and been spending it writing and thinking a lot about kind of the complexity of the social Christian tradition in American life. Um, I also edit a religious biography series with uh, colleagues in my field, Catherine Jin Lum and Mark Knoll. Uh, that series is with Urban's Press and is a, a fun thing I get to be a part of on the side. And meanwhile, here at the seminary, I teach courses, again, on that intersection of Christianity and American public life. So last year, my first year here, I taught a course on social Christianity and American inequality. That's really related to the, the research I was doing for my book. Um, and in the spring, a course on American Christianity and race. One of the real highlights of my first year here was teaching a class called Beyond the Audit, PTS and Race after 1865. Right before the pandemic began, we had an opportunity to really get into the archives and begin to explore the, the seminary's kind of uh, longer history around race uh, and racism in the period after the audit leaves off in 1865. So that's some work that I'm eager to continue doing and, and excited to do um, in the years ahead. This fall, I'll be teaching a course called Evangelicalism and the Making of the Modern United States, which is right in the heart of my interest. And also, I have the privilege to teach a section of our new Life Together course. This is a part of our new curriculum. Perhaps you've heard about it. Uh, and the theme of my course is how we got here, a core question for history and one that I think is really relevant to anyone who uh, cares about the life of the church. How do we get here? Uh, is so connected to how we move faithfully forward. Um, that's really a passion of mine, is to think through that intersection. And I'm just so delighted to be here at Princeton Seminary, and thank you again for your time today. Dr. Carter, thank you so much for this interesting and impressive story you shared with us. Um, I can, I think we all can relate to um, painful uh, Old Testament classes where we try to get through each and every word. Um, and I think we all um, can also share this experience that at some point it's just um, a whole lot of fun and it's just so interesting. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And now it is time uh, for Sheena Roll to start the Q&A session. Um, I hope you can, yeah, okay. Now it is time for the Q&A session. Thank you very, very much. And I give it to Sheena Roll. Good afternoon. Um, I believe everyone can hear me. I will just um, make one final call. That's an interesting um, effect. I will make one final call uh, for folks who may have a question for um, some of the speakers. I know it's been taking in information. So as your hearts and your minds churn, uh, please feel free to drop those questions in the chat directly to me, and I will try to manage, you know, this conversation as well as um, getting more questions in. But we'll start with a question that was posed um, from Otto Zing for all of our speakers. Um, the, the question says, I would like to hear more how the wilderness experiences or dark times of your lives influenced or deepened your story. Um, so whoever would like to start with answering that question. And how does the, the dark times of our lives influence or deepen your personal story? Hmm. I don't look, I'll take a shot at it. Well, I'd like to say something if I could. Um, I'm with the group from 1970, 71 and uh, it's with a great degree of fondness uh, that I've met with several uh, from that group. And in our affinity session last night, we were remarking how when you're in theological seminary and you're beginning your graduate studies for a professional career, you're gonna make life-changing decisions and make lifelong friends. And it's those friends and colleagues that were with me when we marched from Washington. It was those friends that were with me when we decided it was time to pick it and to make a statement for equal rights, voter registrations. And those friends are still with me now. And study hard, pray deeply, and know that God is on the side of the righteous and we shall prevail. Amen. Amen. Thank, Tom, I want to say thank you so much for those encouraging words. I also um, want to clarify, so my apologies, this 
Q and A section is definitely specifically for the free um, speakers and stories that we heard. Um, I think we're definitely going to have lots more time uh, later on in the in the different happy hours to share amongst ourselves. Um, but we want to preserve our time to hear from the speakers. So if any of the three featured speakers would love to take a crack at that uh, that question posed, um, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I will offer. Um... I guess the best answer I could come with in a short period of time. Uh, the wilderness to me, uh, how you handle life's wildernesses, I think this speaks to my own personal development and as well. And it seems that Am I, we I, are mute in I'm the muted? Princeton chapel. There we go. All right. Yes, we can hear you. All right, uh, very briefly. Um, my own personal experience and my own perspectives on how you deal with life wildernesses has to do, again, the sense of meaning. What does the, what does the wilderness mean? Um, is it necessarily negative? Does it have to be a place of challenge, or can it also be a place of op opportunity? Um, I, I'm just gonna say this real quick. If you look at the wilderness experience, uh, like the Exodus story, I think we focus so much on the beginning and the end, and not the 40 years itself. And what I mean by that is this. There are some people who will be born in and will die in the wilderness. We are so eager to reach the promised land oftentimes and talk so much about the promised land that we really don't focus on how do we manage the wilderness itself. There are a lot of people who will never see the promised land. And so what do you do when the wilderness is your home? And that goes to meaning and the opportunity. And if you look at the Hagar story, I think it's very instructive into how we deal with the wilderness. There are things that happen in life during our times of great challenge that force us to see things differently. So my advice would be, in the wilderness, what kind of relationships do you have while you're in this space? And what are you going through? And how do these relationships form how you see your environment? Because the wilderness is not just a place of desolation, it's also a place of great opportunity. So again, not just focusing on the challenges, finding meaning, and what do you see even in these times of great distress in these spaces that are supposed to uh, be so distressing for us oftentimes. Meaning in the wilderness is really the main theme. Thank you so much for that. Yes, Dr. Bowen. Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that's important to think about is the journey of faith is often a difficult journey and to recognize that there will be valleys as well as mountaintop experiences, right? We can't always live on the mountaintop. And so in my own personal life, there's been a number of um, very hard experiences. In 2001, I was in a head-on collision car accident. Um, I've had experiences with you know, loss of loved ones through illnesses. And, you know, those type of experiences can strengthen your faith, but they can also in, in some ways shake it, right? And so I think one of the things that has helped me through those types of experiences is having a community who will be with you in those moments when those moments when you can't necessarily pray for yourself or encourage yourself, you have a support group, if you will, who surrounds you with prayer and love and encouragement. And so in those moments where you experience those types of um, events, I think it's so important to have, um, yes, a community there to be with you and to help you through those times. And yeah, I think that's that's what I will offer for that question. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Bowen. Um, and Dr. Heath, would you like to, um, Dr. Carter, would you like to um, answer that question for us? How does the wilderness experience inform your, your story? Yeah. Um... I, I, it's, a, it's a good question. I think like Dr. Heinz has said, it's one, one that I want to sort of reflect on even more. Um, but I think like both of my colleagues have said, um, I find, as I sort of reflect back, I mean, part of this exercise for me is thinking about 
Um, obviously, we have so many experiences, right? And so what stands out? Where do we see God at work in our, in the kind of messiness of our lives? And I think for me, um, you know, I can think about, you know, sort of, again, the world that I grew up in, in some sense, as a world of, I wouldn't call it wilderness, but a, 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 a a strange world in some ways as I look back on it, and I, I feel like it's a world that shaped me deeply um, and that I know is with me and left its imprint on me in a variety of different ways, uh, a world that I've wrestled with throughout my, my personal life and, and throughout my vocation, but also a world that I, I see God was with me in various ways, even when I was in what I could look back on as a wilderness. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think, again, I want to continue to reflect on this, but I think uh, part of my sense, I mean, graduate school for many people these days is a kind of, it can be a wilderness, right, uh, of wondering and anxiety about what the future might hold. Um, so lots of different points of kind of uh, anxiety and struggle along the way, but also a sense of gratitude for God's presence with me through those times. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we did have a question from Axel Kegler um, for Dr. Hines. Um, and their question says, I'm really drawn to your idea of the role of privilege in story. And I see some serious resonance with Luther's theology of being a theologian on the of the cross in contrast to a theology or a theologian of glory. And so as we find our events and Christ's story meet, um, and we wait for when faith becomes sight. What kind of sight markings? The markings of hope, markings of faith, places of grace. What kind of sight markings have you found, Dr. Hines, at PTS and the wider church? <laughs> well, I, I think that goes to kind of something that Dr. Carr has pointed to, our faith journeys and the things we come from. Um, I think the sight markings for me particularly when it comes to my own personal story and how I view story, has to be the sense of calling. Um, there, there is something about that sense of calling that militates against a lot of the negative stories that we come up against in our development. Um, for instance, the story I told before when I was interrogated in front of Brown Hall about my, 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 where I was from and all that. You know, you could be from a, a place that's not that glorious, not go to a great school, go to a small church, and you still have to ask yourself, what has brought me here? And it's the calling. And that is what I think is the original, kind of the original story that we go back to in the face of all the challenges, the challenges that we have in the wilderness or whatever kind of metaphor you want to use. Mm -hmm. So if, 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 if I were going to say, what is the signpost or what's the thing that I think you have to hold on to, uh, and reforming your story, forming your story, finding your voice, all these different things we use to, to describe this whole process. What is the calling? If you are certain about the calling, the rest of the, the story that you're going through will work itself out. That's what you have to go back to. So to answer the question quickly, it is the call. The call, the call, the call. The call is what you, you, you put your faith in. The call is what, you, is what you go back to. And also the call is what you're also working towards as well. So I think that's very important. And Dr. Hines, don't move away so quickly um, because the next question is also posed to you. It comes from Jasmine Smart. Um, and they say, I was very moved by Jay Hein Paul's presentation and the complexity of sharing stories. And so I wonder if he could talk more about being affiliated with a place like PTS that does have some difficult history within its story. And she is also very grateful for the speaker's vulnerability in sharing your stories with us. So what do you say about um, being affiliated with a place with a difficult story like PTS? Okay, I'm not tenured, so there's some part of the story I can't tell. All right. Praise the Lord, yes. <laughs> I need employment. Um, it's, see, I've been on both sides of the story in regards to PTS. 2004, it was more so, why are you here? Now, when I came here a couple years ago, it was more so like, it changes your story when you're associated with a place like this. So people have expectations. But you see, th there, is, there, is, there is something uh, about the 2004 experience that you can't get away from. Um, being in a space like this 
is challenging for my own story because of my background, but also because what I believe my trajectory is, my sense of calling. I will say this about being at Princeton Seminary. There, there is something about this space that you have to fight against not overwhelming you or defining you. Uh, because it is very alluring to say Princeton Seminary, or Princeton, forget the seminary, this, the, the, the school, the town, it seems so favorably in terms of what, what the dominant story is. How do you fight against that and keep your perspective? How do you maintain your sense of self in a place that's looked at so favorably? So I've been on two sides of it, the negative side why you're here and also the other side of I'm here now, hopefully for a long time. How do I maintain my se sense of self? How do I make PTS a part of my story, not my whole story? I think it's the greatest challenge. I, I think that's a challenge for a lot of faculty persons here and students as well because people see you, they just see Princeton, they don't see the rest of you. So I think that's a challenge you have to work out as well uh, while we're here. Just watching time, that's all, sorry. Oh, it's okay, we have three minutes and I, I'll say I definitely understand and uh, identify with that comment. Um, we have time for two more questions and I'd love to pose it this way, um, a question maybe for Dr. Bowens and for Dr. Carter to answer. And it's about your stories and your areas of specialty. Um, Dr. Bowens, I'm wondering as a Pauline scholar and understanding that deep context of his, his fuller story, how does the work of understanding um, history, culture, all the things that feed into those New Testament narratives, how does that shape the way that you see your story? Wow, that's a great question. Thank you, um, Sheena, for that question. So I think I'm still working that out, actually. <laughs> um, I think for me, you know, growing up, um, being in the family that I grew up in, in the church I grew up in, as I said earlier, scripture was such a um, formative, um, it was so formative for us. And so growing up, I just remember having questions, like I was the kid in Sunday school, which is probably, probably problematic, asking the questions like, who is Paul writing to? And what were these people's lives like? And I wanted to know like the history behind what was happening in the text. And so those type of questions, I think for me now as a scholar, really still resonate with me. And so for me, understanding like what's happening in Paul's world, and then making those um, analogies, if you will, from what's happening in Paul's world and how what's happening then really can relate and resonate with what's happening now. And so I think for me, like the historical context is kind of like a bridge in a way from the past to the present. And as God spoke then, God also speaks now. Like, of course there are differences, but there are also um, resonances that I think we can take with us even now. Um, yeah, and just so for an example, like my, my book that just came out, African-American Pauline Hermeneutics, I think you see, and I, it's, it was an expiring project to work on because I saw myself and some of the interpreters and the moves they make and how they're using Paul to protest injustice and um, yeah, racial inequality and how they see analogs between Paul's context and their own. So mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, so that's, I hope that answers your question, but yeah. yeah. Yes, that was a very illuminating <laughs> answer, appreciate it. And Dr. Carter, similarly as a scholar in American Christianity and hearing the texture of your own Christian mm -hmm. story and maybe some of the changes, how does understanding the movement of American Christianity help you understand your personal kind of Christian story yeah. as it relates to the story of America and the faith? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think partly one way of answering that is to say, as you kind of heard, that I came to the field that I'm in out of my personal story in some sense, that I, I was so, you know, confused and trying to figure out how the, where the world that I grew up in came from. Um, but I think there's a broader thing there, and that's part of why I want to do this work 
um, you know, continuing the work that began with the historical audit here and why I'm passionate about getting church communities and uh, perspect, you know, P PTS students thinking about, um, I do believe that history kind of stories about how we got here are so important for questions about how we should move forward. And um, certainly, you know, for me, studying history became a clarifying window onto my own life and the world that I grew up in. Um, it helped me to have a sense of kind of the wider Christian worlds that are out there. Um, but I think, you know, for, for students who come here and, and for folks who are out there in the world working in churches and nonprofits and whatnot, um, having a sense of the, the history of your community, the history of your congregation, the stories that um, those institutions are telling about how we got here, I guess for me, um, I'm really passionate about us figuring out what makes for a really good, true, faithful story about how we got here. And I think as we, as we kind of work toward that, um, we'll also really be sparking a lot of important insights and conversation about where we're going and, and where God might be calling us. So. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, family, um, that concludes the question and answer session for this. Uh, this is my story um, panel. I am, and all of us are eternally grateful to the three of you and the speakers. And at this point, we will um, turn it back over to Ann Henley, I believe. Yes. Thank you, Sheena. Thank you, Sheena, for moderating that Q&A with our faculty members. Thank you, Hustis, for introducing our speakers and their stories. And thank you especially to Dr. Hines, Dr. Carter, and Dr. Bowens, who is joining us virtually. And we're so glad to be able to see your face now. Um, but we are grateful that we could hear your story nonetheless. Thank you, each of you, for sharing your stories and for reminding us that our stories connect us, that our stories continue, and that many good things came from Nazareth, and many good things came from this. Thank you, God, and thank you, Jay, Paul, Heath, and Lisa. Friends, now I am delighted to invite you to take a break. We will resume at 3.15 Eastern Time with our Alumni Award Association Executive Council Award Recipients presentation. That's a mouthful, but it's going to be great. Ryan Landino is our speaker, and he will join us live, so we hope you will too. Friends, go in peace, and we'll see you soon.